a US media landscape dominated by enormous corporate outlets, democracy now is a rare and vital independent progressive voice. The hour-long show is broadcast on more than 1,300 public TV and radio stations, providing its audience with information and ideas that are often excluded from the mainstream. I'm joined today by Amy Goodman, the host of Democracy Now! First of all, Amy, thank you very much for joining us. Great to be with you. Uh, and I'd like to ask, first of all, about the origins of Democracy Now! You set it up in 1996. Can you tell us about the landscape at that time and what it was you were trying to do with the project? We were the only daily election show in public broadcasting in the United States. Now, the fact that I was the host was interesting because my main question was, why don't people vote in the United States? Or I should say, why do most people not vote? And I thought we could use the presidential election as a way to go from state to state to see what people were doing in their communities. I didn't think the answer was apathy. I thought they were maybe otherwise engaged because perhaps they didn't think there was a real choice by the presidential candidates that the parties don't present that diverse um, of positions. So we started Democracy Now! And we thought it would be nine months and that would be it. You know, the election happened, President Clinton was reelected, but there was more demand for the show after than before. And I think that's because we were giving voice to the grassroots. We weren't going to those typical pundits you get on television. You know, there are networks that compete with each other in the United States, but it seems they have the same guests. Right. You know, we just follow the basic tenets of good journalism. Go to where the silence is. Broadcast through the voice of the people who are most affected by a story. Hear how they are affected by policy or provide a forum for debate between those in power and not in power. There's a reason why our profession, journalism, is the only one explicitly protected by the U.S. Constitution, because we're supposed to be the check and balance on power. And one of the things that seems to be crucial to the independence of democracy now is its funding structure. Could you tell us something about that, how it's run? We began out of Pacifica Radio, which was founded after World War II, a war resistor who came out of the detention camps in California and said, there's got to be a media outlet that's not run by corporations that profit from war. His name was Lou Hill. And so Pacifica was born. It's a five radio station network in the United States, in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Washington, New York, and Houston. And when the Houston station went on the air, it went on the air for a few weeks and it was blown up by the Ku Klux Klan. They strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter, only radio station in the country to be blown up. Um, and when they got back on their feet and they went on the air again, the Klan blew it up again. But he said it was his proudest act. And I think that's because he understood how dangerous Pacifica is. Dangerous because it allows people to speak for themselves. And that's what Democracy Now! is committed to. When you hear someone speaking from their own experience, whether it's a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, an aunt in Venezuela or an uncle in Iraq, you say, oh, you start to understand a place where they're coming from. I didn't say you agree with it. How often do we agree with our family members? But you start to see um, what someone's life experience is. That understanding is the beginning of peace. One of the things I've noticed about the show is, is how multi-platform it is. It spreads across radio and you have TV and internet. And I wondered if you could say something about the difference that um, technological developments have made to the show. So we began in 1996, almost 19 years ago. And right from the beginning, we were on radio and the internet. Then radio stations around the country and the world could just pick up the broadcast. We wouldn't need satellites. And then we moved to television. It was the week of September 11, 2001, by chance. One TV station in New York said, we'd like to broadcast Democracy Now! But that week, as you know, changed the world with the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. But we had begun broadcasting. So stations, TV stations around the country started to ask if they could run Democracy Now! You know, in Iraq, the networks would pay Saddam Hussein millions of dollars to use his satellites. No, we weren't going to do that. So our journalists, like Jeremy Scahill, um, and would use a program, go into an internet cafe in Iraq, and send out about 150 email, which was actually all the email of a video broadcast that we would piece back together in, in New York, and we would broadcast this. When Mubarak uh, shut down the internet during the Egyptian revolution at the beginning, our reporter, Sharif Abdul-Qudus, 
figured out a way to get around that and became one of the top tweeters in the world. And he and Hani Massoud, another of our video producers, both of them Egyptian-American, would do these video broadcasts. He would interview people. Hani would race back home. He would put together these remarkable 20, 25-minute reports. And it wasn't just the bird's eye view of Tahrir, but you would meet the people like they were members of your own family, like the high school uh, young woman who put together Voices of Tahrir, a broadsheet in the shadow of the state media building that had spewed lies for so many decades, or Ahadef Suef, the great Egyptian writer who wrote Map of Love, mm -hmm. talking about this revolution. Nawal Sadawe, at the time 79 years old, she'd run for president, she'd been imprisoned, she'd been exiled, telling the young people, we will win, we will win. And that would come through the internet. We'd have these detailed 28-minute reports of people speaking for themselves. That's the power of democracy now. There's nothing magic or mysterious mm -hmm. about it. I would say it is magical. Because when you hear someone speaking from their own experience, that changes the world. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the criteria you use when choosing what to put in the show? Oh, every day we are, um, we comb the internet, newspapers, talk to people, we travel around the world, we have reporters that we consult with all over the world. and. We are a kind of organic brain trust of producers. I work with an amazing team of people. Mm -hmm. And every day we just winnow down the possibilities. It's not all the news that's fit to print. Whether we're in Vienna, Austria, broadcasting from a public access TV station, they are working with their crew, empowering them, and talking about the growth of nuclear weapons in the United States, because Vienna is such a site, it's where the International Atomic Energy is, and it's a site of anti-nuclear weapons and power, to have these voices join together with people in this country, look at, despite the fact that President Obama had promised in Prague to try to make the world nuclear free, one of the reasons he won the Nobel Peace Prize, the U.S. has, uh, is rebuilding the nuclear arsenal to the tune of trillions of dollars, and few people realize this. So we go to Vienna and we tell this story. Now, for a long time, it's the corporations that have globalized. No one else could afford to. But with the internet, there is grassroots globalization, horizontal globalization. And we provide a media platform, whether it's radio, whether it's TV, whether it's the internet, where people can talk to each other. As in so many places, democracy now is, is currently swimming against the political tides. And I was wondering what difference you feel the show can make concretely on the political situation here. You know, we have an audience that is growing exponentially. It is surprising. I mean, the networks have all of the money, and yet they're losing audience. Why is this the case? Why are we on over 1,300 stations picking up about a station a week, radio, TV, or many l readers, listeners, viewers on the internet? because of those authentic voices that are describing their own experience. For so long, we've been dealing with these issues, whether we're talking about racial inequality, or we're talking about police brutality, or we're talking about the militarization of police. These are themes of our show, because people at the grassroots, that's what they're concerned about. You have the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and what happens to the tanks and the automatic weapons when they are sent back? Well, the Pentagon thinks it's conservationist when it decides to recycle them. And what does that do to our hamlets and towns and communities and cities when local police forces, you know, police are supposed to be peace officers, mm. are using tanks and tear gas to control, they say. Others see it as attack the local population. These are issues we need to hear from people in their communities, because the, they're the ones who are raising them, not just the minority elite, and I'm not talking about people of color, on the networks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so where do you see democracy now going in future? What's next? Well, I hope we are a model for people all over the world to do their own media. Um, I think what we're doing is challenging the gatekeepers, the traditional networks that um, speak from on high. Uh, it is absolutely critical to get out in the streets. As Woody Allen said, 90% of life is just showing up. And you find stories and people, incredibly um, uh, empowering voices, 
that have been working on the ground for so long. And I think people respond to that authenticity. In public media, the audience is getting older and whiter. In, at Democracy Now!'s audience is changing the formula for all of these stations. It's reaching out to a more diverse, younger audience and keeping those older, the older audience and the um, bringing together the generations uh, from people with new, fresh eyes to older people with the wisdom that has been so long marginalized. Uh, that's what I hope we continue to do, is continue to reach out all over the world. We're also translated into Spanish, our headlines for radio and, um, and print. The idea is to reach out in different languages, to reach out throughout the world, as we have been doing, to unite people across the political spectrum in dealing with all of these critical issues. Amy Goodman from Democracy Now! Thank you very much. Thank you.